Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We welcome you to our Gemini webinar. 2025 initiative is a peer learning platform, a platform where individuals and groups from around the world can come together to share and learn from each other and meditate together in service for humanity. And my name is Alexander Ilchuk. And um, before we start our webinar, we'll have uh, an alignment meditation. So let's align with own soul. And connect with the souls of all who joined our webinar today, and those who will join us, and those who will connected with us in our work, extending our connection to the entire new group of world servers. We open up our consciousness connecting with the spiritual hierarchy. And the heart of the hierarchy, the Christ. bring our focus in the center of our group today in the, visualizing the group heart center of all the people who joined the webinar today and we begin our meeting and today we going to talk on the topic of um, communication in the new age and it's uh, I hope it's going to be first in a series of webinars on this topic and uh, uh, the theme of today's uh, conversation would be the new group of world service communicating the vision for humanity and we have two distinguished guests today uh, Kathy Newburn. Uh, hi, Kathy. Hi, Sasha. And Justin Wilkinson. Justin. Hello. Hi. Good to be here. Um, so you had an um, opportunity to uh, read uh, bios of Kathy and Justin, and just summarizing in two words on uh, how I know them. It's that's we. Uh, been working with Kathy on 
uh, uh, for a couple of years. Um, Kathy was one of the co-organizers of the 2012 initiative. And uh, uh, Kathy and Justin has been working on producing uh, videos um, related to the uh, Ageless Wisdom teachings. And so many of you ha had a chance to see those videos. So I want to, first of all, to express my gratitude and I'm sure the gratitude of the whole community for your work that you've been doing together, producing those videos. They're truly amazing. And um, preparing to this webinar, um, I've been thinking about the symbolism of the Pentecost that we just came through last weekend. And we know that uh, the symbolism of one of the symbolism of Pentecost is it's that um, the uh, disciples of uh, Christ, when he's the G Jesus, when he ascended, they got the gift of, of tongues. So, and it's I think it's very symbolic because they started to, to be able to talk on the different languages. And so, I think this task of developing the skills of different tongues, it's really the task of the new group of old servers. Uh, and it's the work of communication, how we communicate the vision for humanity. And so um, I want us today not to have an interview or lecture or anything, but just to have an open conversation on this and share our impressions and our thoughts on how do we communicate the vision to humanity? And uh, we as esotericists, we have the gift of uh, have access to the high wisdom. But how do we communicate that wisdom further? So does any of you wants to start You're sharing your ideas on that? How do we communicate that? I think. Um... <clears throat> We're at an interesting, uh, an interesting time, uh, because you know we have uh, just uh, a lot of different groups and people around the world that are, you know, they come from different languages and different cultures, and so, you know, obviously when you're trying to convey these teachings to someone that's religiously oriented, it's quite different than when you're trying to convey to someone who's more scientifically oriented. So the goal is universal, but like you said, we have to uh, learn to speak different languages, and uh, that is definitely a task at hand. And so it's, you know, as I've learned in my own experience, you know, you're never going to please everyone. And there's so many different uh, conceptions of, I think, the spiritual hierarchy and what it is in the world. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of misnomers around what it is. and. So it, it's definitely uh, something that is a good uh, topic to bring up. So I definitely am glad to be a part of this conversation as I'm always, it's something that's always on my mind, you know, and I use the videos that I make as a way to convey, you know, my own points of view and, and, and also just to be able to convey the Tibetan's teachings in his own words, but in a new format. So uh, anything else you'd like to add, Kathy, before I say more? Um, well, in terms of Pentecost, which you brought up, Sasha, um, I think that's a really interesting um, event, which the Tibetan has indicated will become the the true uh, Aquarian dispensation for uh, Christianity, Easter and Pentecost, the sense of livingness of the risen uh, Christ or world teacher. So um, moving away from the focus of Christianity, which was on death and fear and sin, uh, moving into a more Aquarian uh, understanding of that teacher and his work. So he, the Tibetan does indicate that Pentecost is related to the Last Supper, which you know you brought up in this idea of coming together. The, the Last Supper is the symbol of communion, of brotherhood, of um, symbol, symbolism, of ritual. And so I think it's a really potent um, hint 
for us to ponder on what is the significance of that of that ritual for the Aquarian age because it's the in a way it's the the forerunner of the Aquarian age so if we think about what occurred during that sacred uh, moment it's basically related to sharing um, so you, you we're talking today about the sharing of ideas but it's also um, on different levels it's the sharing of resources uh, a concern that's really in the forefront of most people uh, today it's this um, feeling of um, security the need for security and also the sharing uh, for the those who are spiritually inclined a, a sense of spiritual sharing so symbolized by the the blood and the wine versus the bread which is more related to the physical plane security so I think it's these different aspects of sharing which in includes communication which will occupy us during this coming Aquarian age Yes, and I, I've looked at, you know, I know that implementing the principle of sharing the world's resources is definitely one of the prerequisites for the externalization of the hierarchy, and, you know, as, you know, as the Tibetan has said, it's, you know, it's at least beginning to implement the principle of sharing. It doesn't necessarily mean that the entire world has to be sharing the world's resources and, and that it's no longer a problem that they're not being shared. I think it's, we just have to be moving in that direction. Uh, and when I follow politics and some things that go on with the United Nations, it's definitely something that's becoming more and more uh, alert in human consciousness and people are talking about it more, but it sort of always comes back to, to that problem of, you know, yes, we recognize there's an issue with food shortages and all of these sorts of things, but it doesn't seem yet to be quite a consensus on exactly how to solve the problem. And I think some of that comes from the sort of older, uh, more competitive types of consciousness where things are looked at, well, if it's not profitable, then, you know, it's a waste of time. You know, whenever uh, an idea is brought about, it's like, how do we make profit off of this? And obviously when you're moving into this new direction of sharing the world resources, you know, this is something that's about sharing. It's not about anyone making a profit. It's about the betterment of humanity. So it's definitely uh, a new uh, shift in, in the way that the nations will work and think with one another. And so that definitely seems to be, from what I've gathered, the main issue is getting past that type of consciousness which looks at things as how do we make profits and, you know, how does this benefit me as opposed to how does this benefit the group. Yeah. yeah. It's a very interesting turn that uh, um, this, this our discussion took about it's about uh, sharing, and uh, if we talk about the the new group of old servers, mm -hmm. and uh, our responsibility to communicate the vision, uh, it's this quote that uh, I'm showing on the screen now it's from the uh, telepathy, uh, uh, and it's. It's about how we create that connectivity between the members of the new group to create the shared vision. How do we create that um, shared ideas that further can go forth to humanity and uh, I think it's one of the most um, crucial tasks for us to create that point of tension, so to speak, uh, in our connectivity, that we together could become an instrument, a hierarchical instrument, which could work as a transmitter, an interpreter of that vision yeah well the new group as you know is is the connecting bridge between hierarchy and humanity so <clears throat> it is through that bridge which is the new group that the energy of hierarchy can flow and and that's perhaps our major responsibility is to hold that alignment in consciousness 
especially at times such as this upcoming Gemini full moon, wherein if we stand united as a group, dropping our prejudices and our our uh, shortcomings and our antipathies, um, standing together as a united group, we can bring that energy um, of hierarchy, which is most easily expressed as the energy of goodwill, to the men and women of goodwill who can then um, distribute it to humanity at large. So it's just um, <clears throat> about being a part of the great chain of hierarchy, the chain of being and standing firm and united with all of our group brothers and with the inner teachers. Um, and <clears throat> we have such a great opportunity before us in the next few day days to do that. Yeah, and I think a lot of, I think most intelligently minded people in the world do recognize that that principle of oneness, that we all live on this planet together. You know, many of them may not yet recognize the spiritual significance, but they recognize mm -hmm. the real, reality of it, at least at a physical level, that we are all one and we at least yeah. are on this planet. So at least that's, you know, that you know for that recognition has to come first and then the spiritual recognition of it may come later but um, but again I think there is still so much of the Piscean era in our you know religions and in our institutions and our economics so there's definitely we're at that point where we're you know between two worlds sort of and um, so it's definitely interesting to see how the next decade uh, will unfold and I know one of the other prerequisites besides implementing the principle of sharing is, you know, as we know, that the church needs to clean house. And I think seeing some of the things that the new pope has said and that he's doing, mm -hmm. that's definitely also a sign that that process is up, well, is underway as well. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, it's not just the Catholic Church. It's, you know, it's all religions. So, but, but again, the Vatican and the Catholic Church is such a huge, well, probably one of the biggest ones that he was referring to. So I think, I think that the telltale signs are definitely there. So it's for us, that, that gives us hope that, you know, at least we're moving in the right direction, even, even though the, the work is slow. And, uh, but. Yeah, <clears throat> and the other group that needs to clean house, according to DK, is the pol politicians. Perhaps um, <clears throat> there's a little bit less forward progress in that realm, but, you know, yeah, there's, I mean, a, there's I always follow, hope. <laughs> I don't follow a lot of politics in other countries, but I know that in the United States, you know, it's definitely a bit of a mess, and it seems <laughs> to be just, it's almost hard to describe in words, like to some of the things that are going on, it's, uh, it seems it's almost like the, the last hoorah of the kind of old Piscean me versus the world, you know, kind of take, grab everything for yourself, you know, Kind of mentality uh, that there seems to be a lot of that going on, and I think that's natural because as these new energies are coming into the planet, those people that identify with that older ways of thinking, you know, unconsciously, they're going to be feeling threatened because they'll they don't any anything that comes forward in the world that signifies oneness or anything like that, they are so strongly opposed to. You know, you can think of take Obamacare for example. You know. It's something that they're uh, they're so opposed to because it, it signifies that we're recognizing that we're all one, and that at mm -hmm. some level we should be uh, you know acting accordingly to that. And so even though you know maybe Obamacare isn't perfect yet, but it, again it's a step in the right direction. You have to begin somewhere. And so mm -hmm. I think um, there's going to be a lot of resistance to that. It's very. Uh... Interesting the, the topics that's often discussed in esoteric circles. So it's how do we actually connect uh, the ideas coming from the teaching, how we see their unfoldment in the world around us. And so that's the, this question of how well do we perform our functions to be interpreters of the events around us. And uh, so do, do, what is your experience of the, on that? How uh, actually we, in, how do you interpret the teaching 
translating into, into what's happening around us? Hmm. Well, I think, like you're asking, what what is my interpretation of, of the Tibetan's teachings? No, what's no no. What's your experience on that? Like, is it? Um, I don't know, even say like helpful when you, when you talk politics to people, when you talk uh, about everyday problems like Obamacare or anything else, uh, do you see the work of these are like higher principles? Do you interpret them? Yeah. I mean, I live in Los Angeles, so there's quite a bit of liberal, forward-thinking people here. I'm sure if I lived in certain areas of the country, it would be a very different conversation going on. Uh, but I think most people, regarding just politics, most people that I know, especially even around my age group, which is under 30, you know, everyone pretty much recognizes that the system is just totally screwed up and that the level of corruption goes so high and I, mean, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories and all that stuff, but I think people just recognize that, you know, there's just an inherent flaw in the way that the system itself works. And so it's not so much about trying to elect this person instead of that person, but more that the system itself just needs to change. Because even if you get someone who, let's say, is in a very uh, an Aquarian and forward thinking, and, and definitely recognizes all these things we're talking about, there's so many limitations in just the way the system itself works that that person then has so many limitations. You know, I'm sure there's so many things Obama would want to do and, and, and would like to do, but again, it's like he has so many limitations around him that, you know, he can probably only get one-tenth of those actually through Congress or even in this, into general conversation. So... It seems that the system itself needs to change, and you know that can really only happen, I think, when there, again, it ha there has to be a consensus amongst the general populace of that there's even a problem to begin with, which I think most people are at that point that they recognize that there is a problem, but the next consensus is how do you solve that problem? What you know, what are ways? I think there's lots of different opinions that people have, uh, but again. For anything to truly change, there has to be a, a kind of much more general consensus. And you know, I think obviously we're, you know, we're in a time now where we can't resort to violence, and you know, we don't want something like the French Revolution to happen again. <laughs> obviously, uh, we're not quite at that level yet, but um, you know, who knows? Once things, you know, there's a lot of different. Well, it depends on how. I mean, most people don't want to change until they're forced to. You know, it, it's kind of a survival mechanism until they're really in the corner and they're forced to change. Then are they willing to say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to make some sacrifices if, if you know, if necessary. Yeah. I don't know if, if that answers your question. <laughs> Kathy, do you have anything on that? Um, your experience? What exactly is the question again? Uh, how how do you what is your experience in translating the teaching into word explaining what's happening around you in in the world today? Well, it seems clear to me in trying to translate some of these uh, ancient wisdom ideas. Uh, in terms that people can understand is like trying to educate the public about the just the coming in of the new age. I think that's a really important concept and it's one that is beyond religious dogma or political dogmas. It's just about an astronomical event which has deep spiritual um, implications and I think the whole um, you know just explaining to people what Aquarius is, what it means. Um, and if you want to go further and include the new ray energy that's coming in, which people seem to be um, very responsive to the idea of the rays and what this new seventh ray um, energy is about, I think it helps people to understand that 
there is a plan um, that although things look like they're out of control and beyond our, our control, in fact there are benevolent uh, forces, some might call it God, some might call it hierarchy, who stand behind all of the outer chaos and um, it, it gives people a sense of that vision which is the number one task or one of the number one tasks of the new group to provide for humanity is that sense of vision for without that vision the people perish so we need as as a members of heart center of the new group of world servers to hold that vision before humanity and to live that vision in our daily lives and to not be so caught up in the forefront of um, the withering of the law that's going on all around us, the falling away of the Piscean age and the sixth ray energies, we have to try and communicate that yes, the old is falling away and although it looks like at times that there's nothing to replace it, um, there is indeed, uh, there are indeed many seeds of a new life pouring through the uh, weary veins of earth and um, so for us as a group to be part of that communicators of the vision I think is such a great opportunity for us and we can do that in our daily lives with the people uh, that we know and in our groups and through our um, whatever means of communication we have at our disposal it's a, it's a wonderful task yeah, um, and, and mm -hmm. I have a lot. Oh, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, I have lots of friends also who, you know, are not spiritually oriented, and so they don't really relate to things that are, let's say, more abstract. So I try to use more general analogies sometimes. Like when you think of the, uh, the idea of, you know, at first we went through an agricultural revolution, which lasted thousands of years, and then we went through you know, an industrial revolution, which lasted, you know, hundreds of years. And then, you know, we've been and are going through a technological revolution, which has lasted decades. But now it seems like we're moving into a revolution of consciousness and that we've sort of been following that trend. So that's sort of another way I like to communicate DA, the concept that we're moving into a new age, that now that we're moving into an age where consciousness itself is beginning to change, then if we recognize that everything is consciousness, uh, then if that fundamental aspect of our nature changes, then everything in the world will begin to change because it's a direct you know, s symbol of that. Um. Another uh, question that I want, like before we open our floor to our audience to ask the questions, um, I want to ask um, in our announcement, uh, uh, I, I've included this quote from Tibetan, which really has been fascinating me for years that disciple in all ashrams have a task of modifying, qualifying, and adopting the divine plan simultaneously. Why is it so? Why is the plan not imposed? And I think it's very related to this task of interpretation. It's, uh, I think it's our uh, responsibility and our work as disciples to uh, interpret the plan, bringing it to the words and the terms that speak to different people. And yeah, we talked about Pentecost and about lang different languages that we speak. And I think this, what is this about? But my question is how far actually we can go from uh, the teaching, from interpreting the teaching. The, the, this dilemma between the actual form of the teaching and the essence of the teaching and our freedom to interpret, interpret that essence of the teaching. How do you, do you, do you see that dilemma and how do you deal with that dilemma? Um, well, well Oh, go ahead, Justin. No, no, that's fine. You can go. I'm still formulating my thoughts. So. Well, I, I, I took the opportunity of this uh, webinar to review the Tibetans, um, the words that he's used when he was talking about that concept of modifying, qualifying, and adapting. And it was quite, um, quite interesting to me. Um, and I went up also to the dictionary, which is always helpful 
to look up the terms. And um, he does seem to indicate that these three terms um, relate to the three vehicles. So modification or to modify is more related to the mental plane and qualification is more related to the emotional or astral level and the adaptation is more related to the physical etheric. Um, and he said that these three qualities, modification, modify, qualify, and adapt, are the task of the disciples of the world, um, which was really interesting. I didn't remember uh, reading that before. He gives an interesting um, summation of how he sees the plan working out. He says that those who are the custodians of the plan are the, those who are souls, and he describes the soul as a fourth degree initiate. So those are, the, those are the people who really hold the true vision or the seed of the plan, and then it's the soul-infused personalities or those who are in process of becoming soul-infused um, who are the disciples of the first, second, and third degrees their task is to modify, qualify, and adapt, which is um, keeping their voice in that midway point, like receptive to the vision of the plan as held in the minds and hearts of the fourth degree initiates, and then also because we are in the world, uh, being able to be responsive to the masses of humanity, particularly the intelligentsia of the world, and trying to see how we can seed their consciousness with the work that we do so that they can in turn bring those aspects of the plan that are um, immediately need to be implemented in the world. So it's like a three-way process and we're the midway point of that process. So, and just to, to give a few other of the actual words, if I can find them, because I have a few papers here. Um, yeah, he talks about in this process of modify, qualifying, and adapting the plan of the need for spiritual compromise. He says that's the number one quality that we need. And the way he describes that was, I thought, very much, um, it seemed to me, of moving away from a sixth ray um, way of working into a much more seventh ray. Sixth ray being more in your face, fanatical and seventh ray being much more diplomatic. So he says, spiritual compromise negates fanaticism, requires a trained and intelligent understanding of applied measures and truth. It negates evasion of responsibility and involves also a comprehension of the time equation of differing points in evolution, plus experience in the process of discarding the outgrown and unnecessary, no matter how good it may appear to be. So he speaks of um, also of a needed fluidity of mind that, as he says, can move on from that which worked and trying to become sensitive to the need of humanity today. And this, I find, with this seventh ray energy coming in, involves a constant ability to look at what's working and what isn't working, and to adapt on this physical etheric plane uh, the vision so that it's meeting the need today. Yeah, and you know, I think with some of the work that I do in video production, um, you know, a lot of the work I've done is for hobby has been to just take the Tibetan's teachings you know, and his words as they are, and just put them into a video presentation. Uh, and then also to, you know, in my own words, step things down and make it much more introductory for a more general audience. And so uh, I've been working sort of tirelessly on that for the last four or five years, I would say. Um, but I think eventually, I mean, my goal at some point, uh, you know, is to, I see, you know, as we have, the whole decade here before us, leading up to 2025, um, I, I think a, a real effective way is at some point, I mean, at least my goal is up from this, from sometime between now and 2025, to get into uh, Hollywood 
and to get into what I could call spiritual infiltration, where you know a film, a feature film, could be produced um, that could be something that could at least introduce the ideas of these sorts of things that we're talking about. That there is, you know, an energy that connects everything in life together, and that consciousness and energy are entwined with one another and that, you know, there are higher levels of consciousness that individuals can attain and these sorts of things. And so that's definitely, I'm keeping my, my mind and my eye set on that because, you know, film is, is a way that, you know, we, when we look at films that have come out recently, uh, you know, a, any successful film is something that can always tap into the the collective unconscious and, and tap into these archetypes that exist in human consciousness. And so even if people are not aware of these sorts of things or aware of esotericism, they'll still relate to it at a deep level because it's inherently a part of, of who and what we are. And so, um, yeah, so I think, again, be, I, I like to approach these things from two aspects of, you know, the more practical aspect of, you know, the resources that I have at bay in, in my life right now, and then the kind of the what if question of, you know, so, I'm tr so I use that as uh, something to move forward to. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share before we move on to the questions um, or comments. When I looked up in the dictionary the, the definition of the three words, uh, modify, qualify, and adapt, they were all quite similar. But they all had a you know a very interesting message for us, I think, as as a terrorist. Um, so to, to modify was to make partial or minor changes, um, typically so as to improve it or to make it less extreme. So you know the Tibetan's using these words. He's giving us a I think a a clue. You know, make changes to make the the ideas less extreme to the general public, um, and then to qualify is to make less severe or extreme. Again, very similar. Make something less harsh, less strict, more moderate, he says. And then for ad adapting something, he says, again, make suitable for a new use or purpose. Become adjusted to new conditions. So again, it's, it's taking these great ideals, uh, these ideas, stepping them down so they become ideals and then actually uh, allowing the intelligentsia of the world to step it down even further so that it meets uh, the need of humanity today. And I think some examples of that is we know that the Tibetan did state, I forget in which book it was, but that, you know, that the teachings he's written have been geared towards a Christian audience and so we know mm -hmm. that, you know, he's used a lot of Christian terminology and that was probably appropriate back in the 30s and 40s when Alice Bailey was writing her books. But now I think we definitely do need to modify that. And so obviously, you know, using as an example what Lucis Trust has done with their adapted version of The Great Invocation, you know. Yes. Naturally, you know, just because so many people now are beginning to sort of not really identify with religion as much. It, it, you know, that there's a lot more people that are spiritual but not religious. And so the moment they hear religious terminology, I think a lot of walls come up and they immediately kind of, oh, they don't want to associate themselves with that. So I think it's definitely good to find um, ways to make the language more practical and more scientific. Uh, and so that's definitely something that I've been working with and working on doing. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with that. Um, it's unfortunate, perhaps, that language has become such an issue, and sometimes we could even see that perhaps the, um, you know, the materialistic forces have used that um, to sort of um, impede the spread of the great invocation, you know, which is our greatest tool, we're told, the, the most powerful tool that we were given is the great invocation, the most powerful tool for preparing the way for the externalization and the reappearance, but if it becomes hijacked along the way um, and prevented from uh, attaining the status of a world prayer, which is its intended um, 
goal, then you know we have to do something to um, prevent that from happening. And so, you know, that's the reason why it was ad adapted. Uh, it's not to say that the original wording is not the preferred wording for us to use in our own uh, meditative work, but when we're trying to present it to a public, we the Tibetan makes it clear that you have to present it um, with the idea in mind of the group that you're presenting it to. If you're presenting it to a Christian audience, of course use the original wording, um, but if you're presenting, as Justin said, to the general public, which by and large is, um, at least in this country, uh, moving rapidly away from the religious um, aspects of this Christianity, um, then we have to adapt it. Um, I want to open now the floor uh, for the audience and not just for the questions uh, or comments, but what do you think? How far can we go in interpretation, in modifying, qualifying, and adopting the divine plan? Uh, so please, uh, uh, now everyone is muted by default, um, just in order to avoid sound reverberations. But if you want to speak, please use the function, raise your hand. It's a button on your dashboard, and uh, uh, we will unmute you. And uh, I will now will unmute Deborah Oliver. Hello. Yes, hello, Deborah. Yes, hello, Deborah. Um, thank you for this wonderful uh, webinar. And I wanted to share um, something that I've been working with um, as a mediator, a conflict resolver. Um, and of course, then you have to really struggle to find common language. Uh, to resolve conflict between different polar polarizations. And um, what I have found to be extremely useful and uh, something that takes everything out of the language of polarization is I work a lot with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which yeah. probably everybody is familiar with. You know, we all have physiological needs and economic and safety needs and love and belonging needs and self-esteem and self-actualization. Um, <clears throat> and I have found this um, framework to be um, uh, hugely successful in uh, bringing people together of all polarities and stripes because they really can acknowledge that yes, we all have these needs. This is really the basis that's very publicly recognizable of our common humanity. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm putting out the idea that wouldn't it be great if instead of Republican, Democrat, <laughs> Communist, Socialist, whatever, we could say, can we all agree that it would be a, a worthy goal for, for us all to um, seek a world where everybody has all of those needs met or has the opportunity to meet those needs. And so, you know, when you look at countries, how many of them have self-actualized? How many of them have their whole population with all of their economic needs met or a place to belong and be educated and self-esteem and self-actualization? But um, when you look at Sweden, for example, um, because of the way that they have progressive taxation and the way their economy is structured so that their citizens basically have their economic or safety needs met and their physical needs met, that they're in the process of, of closing their prisons because their crime rate has gone down. Um, and that's solely because the lower portion of the needs, the physical and, and economic needs have been met. And so um, this, this idea is totally non-political, it's totally non-religious, it's just something that's so basic um, to, to all of our existence that um, I find that very, very polarized people can embrace that language or that system of thought without feeling that they're um, betraying their own political party or their own, you know, religious 
uh, beliefs and so forth. So, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think you know most people can't recognize that we all breathe the same air, and everyone has to eat. Everyone needs somewhere to sleep, and so you know, regardless if you're left or right, conservative or democratic, everyone can recognize that. Um, again, I think some of the issues that come up with people is again the, the the you know the element of selfishness that's inside people and the the way of the older ways of thinking of well I don't really care about other people I, I need to look out for myself so uh, but you know I think Sweden you know definitely is a good uh, example of uh, of you know of that it's very good approach uh, I think but at some level I would expect that it's it's still we would face the question of expanding the consciousness and understanding that your needs depends on the needs of others and then all collective needs depends on the needs of the environment and that we all interdependent and so uh, I think the challenge is there how to expand that pyramid of needs and that's that evolutionary task for uh, for humanity now yes well it's definitely it's 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 not again it's not a technological problem we have the technology to implement these issues it's just a, it's again it's about building up that consensus of okay this is the most effective and efficient way to solve the problem of world hunger you know it's you know it's I don't think it's a matter of oh is there enough food to feed everybody do we even have enough food is there enough resources there are the world is abundant it's just that the resources are not fairly and intelligently distributed so um, that seems mm -hmm. to be the issue again is the the consensus amongst the, the different people and even in America it's a different issue you know there's lots of you know, I mean, a lot of nations in Europe, for example, you know, I think there's a more, there's definitely a more general consensus amongst the populace. But, you know, the United States faces, because of just the size, not only the size of the country, but, you know, different geographical locations in the, in the states are so different. I mean, America is almost like five or six different countries all kind of mashed into one. And so here you have so many different points of views and ways that people look at the world and stuff so it's definitely a challenge here but but if America could do it then I would definitely say anywhere else anyone else could do it mm -hmm. um, again I invite questions and comments from the audience and uh, Kathy there is a question from Iris she's asking about uh, the source for that quote that you share it on the um, spiritual compromise compromise mm -hmm. Oh, Iris. Well, you know, I'm not good at putting down my references, but I could send it to you later. Uh, I don't have the exact page. But I think it follows on, it perhaps follows right, right upon the, the quote that you have there, in D Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, 391. I think it's right following that um, on that page. But um, <clears throat> I have a few... Uh, a, sort of a file of quotes I can send to you, Sasha, if you want, and then you could share with people mm -hmm. if you want to. Continue. Yeah, definitely. We could uh, uh, put that file with quotes to the our archive section where the recording of this webinar will be stored. One one interesting point that I think is really hopeful that the Tibetan makes, I think it's an externalization of the hierarchy, um, he talks about a group of fourth degree initiates that are coming in uh, along the economic line who will completely um, restructure the entire economic system of the planet and will implement the principle of sharing and they will take the resources of the planet and distribute them equitably to all of the countries of the world. So I don't think it's a distant goal from the way he said it. Um, it's something that can be realized within this century, I would assume. So, um, yeah, I think it's I, I very agree. helpful. There, there yeah. are, there's lots of uh, with the research that I've done. There's there's lots of models 
yeah. that have been created. I know the um, the Venus Project is one that mm-hmm. came out, which is which what was a part of the whole zeitgeist movement. And, yeah. uh, you know, they definitely have looked at ways and they've consulted with economists and engineers. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think one approach is to have each nation of the world come up with a tally of these um, these are the amount of citizens we have in our country and so this is therefore the amount of food we need to feed everyone and then each nation needs to come up with a tally of you know this is uh, our demand and this is our supply so this is what we need to feed our nation but these this is the tally of the amount of resources that we have obviously some nations have much more natural resources than other nations do so there's going to need to be um, a balance that's found between you know some nations have you know more resources but perhaps a less population or some nat- or vice mm-hmm. versa so there's going to be a, a balance that needs to be found between you know and I think that can be found but again it, that requires group thinking and group consciousness and that's you know that's an Aquarian function that's just a, pro- a process that's being born right now and so uh, I think you know we're, we're, we're moving in that direction so well, well, when Deborah spoke about Sweden, um, the Scandinavian countries, as most of us know, are heavily taxed, and that's something that's accepted by all of the people. And so I think the future will see the institution of uh, a heavier tax rate on corporations and those individuals who are benefiting from corporate, corporate structures in our world. And the Tibetan makes it clear it won't be that the New Age will... Um, turn people away from initiatives if they're so inclined to amass large sums of money, but they will have to pay taxes on that money, and and that's the unfortunate situation now, at least in the United States, wherein many of the corporations are finding sophisticated ways of not paying their fair share, so that the the rest of the country is you know sinking in certain respects into poverty and lack of educational facilities. So we we need to rectify the situation in order to go into this age of sharing and brotherhood, compassion. And I think, the whole, you know, since around 2011 with the whole Arab Spring and mm-hmm. Occupy Wall Street movements, that is, you know, definitely a, an expression and a sign on the outer physical plane that humanity inwardly has recognized that problem. Yeah. And again, the, the, a lot of the criticism with the, the Occupy movement is that there was no consensus. There were, everyone was saying, well, they all just don't seem to really know what the, the solution is to the problem. But again, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's making that first step towards recognizing that there is a problem to begin with. Yeah. And yeah. so um, that, yeah, I mean, that wealth ratio inequality is definitely a problem. And, it, and I mean, it's hard to say because it seems as the poor get more poor, the rich get richer. And I think it just it may have to reach some point where it'll need to get more worse for it to get better. You know, I think eventually maybe the wealthier population or percentage of the population will have to recognize, okay, well, we can't let the middle class just completely collapse. You know, if, if the value of the dollar decreases and there's more wealth inequality, you know, they're going to have to recognize at some point, okay, you know, maybe we do need to restructure some things. Um, yeah, well, definitely economical needs is one of the directions that we can apply our skills of interpretation to teaching. So it's very good uh, theme for us to ponder. And meanwhile, I, I'm unmuted Barbara Rolf. Barbara? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. I really appreciate this subject and what Kathy and Justin are sharing, what everyone's sharing. This is really phenomenal, and I hope we continue on this. What I wanted to share was that um, a very key player in communication is the press and media, and that has expanded in a way that we're trying to play catch up with. The good news is that change occurs when there is an upswelling from the people and there are those in the press who are stepping out in the press and the media and all these areas of communication who are stepping out and helping to lift the veil that the material 
forces have tried to keep hidden with misinformation and distortion. Uh, lifting that veil, bring the light out, which is the, the task of the press and media, to educate people from a disinterested or detached place of non-bias, public-spirited um, participation of spreading truth. It's small now, but we need to be sharing with people we come in contact with, as well as from our own hearts, with the press. Whenever we see anything being written or anything being published in social media or anything like that, if we have access to it, it is so helpful to give thanks to those people. What I found is that if I write letters, I read something in the newspaper or uh, some other media connection, and it is expressing these truths that we want to bring out and show people that they can make a difference and that they have the information that they need to understand what's really going on all over the world, where the sharing, where the needs are truly, they realize they can make a difference. And I found that writing in and saying, I really appreciate your talking about this, and then bringing up some of those subjects that we've been talking about in fields of economics or, or religion or education or health in a way that we are modifying and adapting our language but still getting those letters to the editors out so the information is available. It's, it's so helpful. I can't believe that some of the changes with even, say, conservative politicians by constantly going out from the heart but communicating through the media as well as their representatives, changes are occurring. Slow, but it's happening. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, I've unmuted Nancy Cipher. Nancy? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for your insights. And Barbara, that's a wonderful bridge building idea. Uh, I think it can, I can see how it can work by supporting those who are getting the message out, uh, which is the truth as we understand it, but though maybe step down quite a bit. But you can your technique allows for bringing another dimension of understanding to those very people and I think it's it's wonderful um, and thank you Justin and Kathy and Sasha and <laughs> for this uh, forum it's it's a wonderful opportunity and as I was listening I was not sure at all what we'd be talking about today what we'd be hearing about but as I was listening I was realizing that I have devoted a good deal of my life to answering these questions. Um, I came from a background in the, very much within the mainstream and mainstream thought. Uh, I was a writer for many years before I awakened spiritually. And so I understood what the consciousness was within the mainstream. And when I awakened and began to study DK's teaching, I realized the gulf that there was uh, between esoteric students and people in the mainstream. And it became one of my um, missions, or the mission of my life over time, to try to fill that gap. Um, and what I realized when studying DK was that basically he identifies or associates the New Age with the soul. He basically says that the soul will be predominant in the new age. And on that premise, um, if we understand the change, if we understand the change in consciousness that has to occur uh, to get to that place, I think we'll be able to answer our question. The question that's coming up today, how do we get people to see things differently? How do we bring new understanding to to people who have innately perhaps an understanding of what could be. Um, the example that came to mind when I was listening to everybody earlier was Nelson Mandela. 
because he embodied qualities of the soul and people recognized that in him. They saw in him a different kind of human being and he was for a period of time the most highly regarded human being on the planet around the time of his death. People recognized in him what you might call the higher angels of our nature or the qualities of soul that the books are, are filled with. And if we see the soul as another level of consciousness, as the higher self, which more and more people are seeing it as, I think we have a point of departure. And in fact, that's what led to the writing of When the Soul Awakens with, with Martin. We could see that that was a way in which to discuss what, what lies ahead the very existence of soul consciousness in which of course there's an acceptance of sharing because we recognize that we're part of the whole etc cetera, etc cetera. so this idea that there is a higher self there is there are better angels of our nature um, there is higher consciousness there is the soul and that the soul connects us all to one another by by the nature of its being then I think we can um, work on changing consciousness by shifting to something real and the vision of a new age is really the vision of the soul what we can see when we look ahead is what would the world be like if everybody were an awakened soul and from that I think we can do some good I wanted to mention um, in terms of Sasha's question how far can we go from the original wording one of the techniques we used in our book, When the Soul Awakens, is to put the, the tenets, let's say, of the Tibetan's teachings into the mouths of, of other great beings throughout history. So it doesn't seem like a cult or it doesn't seem like one particular teaching, but when you find quotations from other people who've arrived at the same understanding through their life experience, through their multi-life experience, uh, then, then you can demonstrate the universality of these concepts. And I think through the universality, uh, we, we get an expanded picture of this reality to which we're moving. Um, I also wanted to mention that Pentecost, as I understand it, uh, was an event in which um, not everyone spoke a different language, but everyone heard what was being said by spirit in their own language. And the idea was that the disciples came together uh, in the spirit of love for their master. And in that spirit, they were one. And yet they could hear what was being said, each in their own language. And somehow I think that that, that idea is, um, well, it helps us to better understand the nature of the Christ festival that is upon us. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Nancy. This it's really beautiful, and this image that you shared of hearing it in spirit, it's very be beautiful. And I want to thank you and Martin, as I know you as one of the great communicators of the teaching and interpreting the teaching, and for all your work that you've been doing for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I, I, I relate to that a lot, and I, I have a lot of people I know that you know that under they can at least recognize that aspect that there is a higher self and that there is a, a level of consciousness that we can't tap into, and I think a, and a lot of people in many ways have at least they've glimpsed that reality in, in their own life experience, and so when when I'm conveying that to people, you know, you can share your experience, which can help a person elaborate on their own experience. I mean, and I think I've, I've had a lot of uh, instances where I, I've talked about pe these things with people and they recognize these things, but they haven't even recognized it. Like they know it, but they don't know it. You know, like they've, they've recognized it. It's like, oh, right, I do see. I, I have had, had that experience. And so I think when you, um, you know, again, there's so many limitations with words. So I always like to kind of refer to the reality that, you know, the soul is this, you know, this energy on this higher level of existence, and it's in itself is beyond language. It's beyond words, and you know we can use symbols to um, to emphasize its reality. But um, but with with that awareness, you can see then how we do need all these different religions, and we do need all these different ways 
of, of conveying philosophy and mysticism and these sorts of things because it, it needs to come through all of these cultural filters and language filters that we have. And so that is definitely an emphasis of helping people realize the scope of the ageless wisdom and how broad and vast it is. And um, I'm always trying to adapt my language to better, to be more effective and, and more efficient. And I, and I know that even, again, we talk about the new age that we're moving into, but unfortunately that term, new age, has you know become identified in, in many people's minds as something that's, oh, new age, meaning it's phony or doesn't really have any credibility. So I'm always open to discussion of what is a new type of language that we can use. Because unfortunately, so many people don't associate what the new age is with the way that we are implying it. I want to read um, a couple comments uh, that people shared uh, through the qu uh, question section of the control panel. Um, so Bob Shihadek says, mass consciousness, which plays out as public opinion, is affected by groups good and bad. Yet looking back over time, the mass will to good is slowly emerging. By holding the vision of the one life before humanity, the new group of world service inspires change. Thank you. That's true. Thank you. And another comment from uh, Riza D'Angelis. Uh, focusing ourselves as the new group of world service working together. It is important to me what we are doing each month together as this at the solar festivals. Let us recognize that we are, through our communications, attempting among ourselves, the new group of world service, to share what we envision, know, and are doing. And this is assisting each of us and our groups to be more effective as communicators servers in the world. Thank you, Risa. Thank you. And there is one more uh, raised uh, hand and uh, Monica Bebel and we approach the time when we have to s start meditate. But, um, yes, Monica, we can uh, hear you. Yes, hello, everybody. everybody. Uh, hello. Hello. Can, yes, uh, first, thank you for all these wonderful contributions. Um, what I would like to say is that, uh, for example, for those who are doing astrology, this is a very good means to convey things in a type of uh, psychological language, as is uh, psychology in general. Um, I'm sometimes doing interpretations, and uh, people who are coming are normally in a state of uh, problem and um, they are looking for uh, answers to their questions and I think that by uh, explaining um, their charts or the uh, transits um, one can easily talk in general about um, what they would like to change or whether there would be other ideas and so um, let flow uh, some ideas from the the Tibetan uh, just into the whole uh, discussion, uh, giving them at least a certain sense that uh, there is meaning and uh, that there is something behind things. So um, I think it is uh, also uh, quite a good solution um, using psychological terms and uh, making pay people think uh, think about it. It has been often often said here now in the discussion that we have to find um, a new language and I think uh, that uh, psychological terms are, are very good suited for that. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It's, it's interesting to, in relation to what you just said, to note that in the teachings we're told that the way that the Ageless Wisdom teachings will be first communicated to the intelligentsia is through the teaching on esoteric psychology, including the rays and astrology. And astrology is something that 
is pretty well rounded and accepted by a lot of people. I mean, I know a lot of people who are not really spiritual, but they have a, a, a you know, I, I guess you could call it a belief that astrology is real or that it has some significance. So it's definitely you know, a gateway to, 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 to enter into people's minds. Well, there are definitely much more that can be said on this topic. This theme and topic is um, rather large, and I definitely hope that we will have a chance to continue this conversation. And but definitely, we can meditate on this. And this meditation that Kathy will lead us in it would be, I believe, with a focus on this. Um, and just before. Uh, we go into meditation. I want to read uh, one more comment that came from uh, John Horan. I just love it. The template and anthem of the common era has already been written. It's the song Imagine by John Lennon. As a forerunner avatar, he's given us the formula, if we can but follow it. So let's imagine all together. So, Kathy. Thanks, Sasha. Um, when Sasha asked me to lead the meditation for today's meeting, um, I happened to be doing a medita this meditation, and I hadn't originally thought at all of using it, but I decided that since the theme of this um, webinar was about adapting, um, this meditation is very simple. You know, oftentimes we become very highfalutin in our meditation work, and um, but this is a meditation that's on goodwill. It's part of um, a group that was established at the Trust, the Lucis Trust, called the Goodwill Meditation Group. Um, and it was suggested that this meditation be used every Wednesday, if possible, at 12 noon. And that if we link with all the other individuals throughout the world who are using it, we can stimulate goodwill in the world. And since we are approaching the Festival of Goodwill, I thought it might be appropriate to use this. So let's just take a minute of silence to link up in thought with all those people throughout the world who are part of the Goodwill Meditation Group. and reflect on the fact of relationship. You are related to your family. To your community. To your nation. to the world of nations. And to the one humanity. And we sound the mantra of unification in its adapted wording, in an adapted wording. The souls of all people are one, and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to heal, not hurt. Let pain bring due reward of light and love. Let the soul control the outer form and life and all events and bring to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and insight. Let the future stand revealed. 
let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail. Let all people love. Reflect on your own and humanity's relationship with the spiritual hierarchy, the inner government of the planet. Imagine that you're standing within the center of the spiritual hierarchy, immersed in the consciousness of the Christ, the world teacher, the heart of love within hierarchy. Maintaining that high point of contact, let your thoughts reach out to include all members of the human family in whom the energy of goodwill is active. Silently sound the mantra of love. Visualize the energy of love flowing from the hierarchy through the men and women of goodwill into the hearts and minds of all people 
infusing them with goodwill, creating loving and harmonious relationships. Now meditate on ways of spreading goodwill, creating right relationships, resolving problems, and restoring peace on earth. Realize that you're helping to build a channel between the hierarchy and humanity through which the energy of goodwill may flow, uniting humanity, solving its problems, healing all differences and cleavages. linked in thought with all men and women of goodwill all over the world, sound the great invocation with deliberation and full commitment to its meaning, knowing that you are radiating its potent energies to humanity. I will use the original wording at this time. From the point of light, within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love, within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know 
answer from the center which we call the race of men let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells let light and love and power restore the plan on earth It's helpful to remember that this is the festival of goodwill and so this energy um, that we were working with in this meditation is being released in a flood tide during this period and it's also known as the festival of humanity so it's really having a profound uh, radiation to all hearts and um, we, as the meditation indicates, create that bridge between hierarchy and humanity so we can be instrumental in um, giving this energy of goodwill wider distribution. And just um, also to remind people that it doesn't end really with this full moon because in certain writings of the Tibetan, he does indicate that we extend the radiation through to the next new moon period. So um, we can hold that in our thoughts that through the next two weeks we can also be working with this distribution of the energies of the higher interlude period. Thank you, Kathy, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And thank you everyone for uh, being together today. And uh, as we approach the peak, the summit of the Gemini full moon, um, let's stay connected. And uh, as usual at the end, I announced our next webinar. And uh, today I will announce three webinars instead of one. Following our last webinar in Vesak, 
one of the feedbacks that uh, came this was from uh, uh, Catherine Swenson uh, whose impression was that it's there is an urge now for different groups and networks esoteric networks working together today uh, be connected and come into alignment conscious alignment and uh, so your impression was that it would be great that during the Gemini exact time full moon there would be uh, such an action of an alignment and so following your um, idea here meditative impression uh, the coordinating group of uh, coordination group of 2025 initiative uh, came up with a suggestion to have the uh, exact time uh, webinar for this full moon and we call it so we called it alignment action and so we invite everyone to link subjectively during this full moon exact time on the full moon connecting with the groups and networks of groups with whom you work and about which you know and extending that alignment further to the entire new group of world servers and as our own contribution uh, we will organize the exact time webinar and so uh, please join this webinar if you will have a chance it will be on um, 3.45 GMT time on June 13th um, and you can calculate the time for your time zone uh, on your own and it will be mostly a silent meditation and our next um, regular full moon uh, solar festival webinar will be cancer festival uh, webinar and it uh, will be a webinar with Michael Robbins um, on July 12th and the topic would be I build a lighted house systemic process of building and lighting from within own Cancerian temple uh, as anything what Michael does it should be very interesting so I invite you to join this webinar and I also want to invite you to join this coming Saturday to the broadcast of the Arcane School conference uh, in London uh, for, for definitely for the entire entire uh, webcast would be very interesting but specifically for the panel on the secrets of water as it will uh, in a way continue the webinar that we had in Aquarius with uh, Lawrence Newey and Mintz Wandervelt uh, on the electrical age of Aquarius and this panel at this uh, Arcane School conference will lead to our uh, second webinar on this topic which will be happening in Leo uh, solar festival the electrical age of Aquarius part 2 secrets of water so if you're interested in this topic would be uh, please join this webcast and uh, let's keep this theme in our meditative focus to Leo full moon thank you very much thank you thank Let's you again Let's imagine and keep our connection. Have a good day. Okay, bye for now. Bye.